Nicotine straight up is not the same as smoking. Now, full disclaimer, I don't use nicotine, but I know the literature pretty well. It, smoking has a lot of different things going on there. A lot of different compounds, one of which is nicotine. Could nicotine be addictive? Yes, there is evidence there. Could it be the most addictive component of cigarettes? Don't really know. But what we do need to talk about is nicotine for longevity purposes, because we're seeing people talk about it. We're seeing well-established, credible researchers talking about it, and the utilization of those Zin pouches and those nicotine pouches, it, it's only increasing. So we should address this. So let's go ahead and break down how nicotine impacts our longevity, what it does to our brain, how it can impact our metabolism, because there's interesting literature, even for fat loss, which is kind of wild, and we'll go into all of it. And after today's video, a big thank you to Create and a 50% off discount link for Create Creatine Gummies. These are creatine gummies that are sweetened with allulose, so you're not getting a bunch of sugar like you usually do with a lot of gummies. And these things are dosed appropriately at 1.5 grams of creatine per gummy. So you can take small little doses or you can increase the dose as much as you want because creatine is really quite effective and considered very safe. And when it comes down to the world of longevity, which is the topic that we're talking about, creatine has some pretty solid evidence when it comes down to maintaining muscle mass, when it comes down to potential neuroinflammation. It's honestly one of the least expensive and most effective supplements, in my opinion, for longevity. Not to mention a 50% off discount link is pretty awesome. So a big thank you to Create, and that link is down below in the top line of the description underneath this video. Okay, we're gonna jump right into how nicotine kind of works first. The physiological and the neuronal effects of nicotine, like when you smoke a cigarette or take in nicotine, it has to do with the nicotine binding to what is called the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Now, these receptors are all over our body, which is why you can get a full body sensation with nicotine sometimes. You can feel it everywhere, but the largest concentration is obviously in our brain, which is why we feel so much in the way of memory increases. Sometimes we even feel like our decision-making is better, regulate emotions better. Those things are very, very real. Now, in some people, it can go overboard where they feel anxious and they feel uh, wired up. That's very real too. But with that, anytime something's impacting the brain like that, we have to ask, is there a negative aspect or how is it potentially benefiting us? So with this, we look at a study that was published in the journal Alzheimer's. Now, full disclaimer on all of these studies today. Okay, I have to be very, very transparent. Not much human literature out there for longevity benefits with nicotine, but lots of rodent model stuff. But that's okay because that's where we start. Okay, we start with this stuff, and if we look at the rodent model literature, we can make an educated decision if this is something we may want to try as humans. So I have to give that disclaimer to be real. Okay, so journal Alzheimer's disease. This is fascinating. They took rats and they gave them either one milligram or eight milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Okay, so they gave them either a low dose nicotine or a high dose nicotine. They did this for 14 days. And what they found is that the proteins that are associated with Alzheimer's disease and beta amyloid plaque production went down significantly when nicotine was in the equation in a dose dependent fashion. Although between the low dose and the high dose, it wasn't an astronomical difference, suggesting that potentially a low dose could be helpful here. But what was really interesting is when they blocked the nicotine receptors, okay, when they blocked those nicotonic acetylcholine receptors, it didn't have the impact. It didn't have that positive effect. It didn't stop those proteins. So based on this, it's very clear that it has to do with the nicotine binding to the nicotine receptor in terms of reducing these proteins associated with Alzheimer's. So this next study published in the British Journal of Pharmacology, it took a look at nicotine's ability to be neuroprotective, to protect against compounds which may not be good for us and may damage the brain. This is pretty wild. So what they found is that nicotine had a neuroprotective effect ranging from 47 to 55% when they would give rats 6-hydroxydopamine or in a particular case, even amphetamines that could cause issues with the brain. So basically they were saying, okay, let's cause some neurological, let's cause some neuroinflammation, let's cause some damage here, right? Well, 47 to 55% protection from the nicotine. That's really wild. So it kind of makes us wonder like what exactly is going on here? What's the mechanism? 
Well, it's easiest to look to inflammation because neuroinflammation is a big problem, especially with unhealthy aging, right? So we turned to a study that was published in FASEB journal. And this is kind of wild because once again, it's all rodent stuff, but they found that nicotine directly reduced nuclear factor kappa B. It actually stopped the activation of nuclear factor kappa B. What that is, is sort of the master regulator of inflammation, especially it's like a control center for inflammation. So it had a big impact there, but there was some other stuff too. It also stopped something that is called MAP kinase. Now MAP kinase, I don't expect you to know what that is or even really care. But all I'm gonna tell you here is that it's very, very relevant to neuroinflammation. So when you stop the activation of MAP kinase, you potentially slow down the inflammatory response. And neuroinflammation is associated with all kinds of neurodegenerative conditions, not to mention just feeling foggy and not feeling alert and bright, right? So with this, it seems as though nicotine has some very strong promise for the brain. But let's pivot over to another area. Let's talk about metabolic health, like our mitochondria, which is also in our brain, but our mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, right? We know that from sophomore biology class, but the mitochondria, when they become dysfunctional, that is a hallmark of aging. When we age, our mitochondria just get crappier. They get less efficient at using fuel. fuel excuse me. So when we look at nicotine's ability to affect mitochondria, it gets very exciting. There is this study published in neuropharmacology, again in rats, but it found that nicotine decreased the respiratory control ratio. What does that mean? Respiratory control ratio of mitochondria, that is basically the mitochondria's ability to be idling or on standby at a low speed, right? So it's almost like a car that can idle but not use a lot of fuel. But the ratio to being able to create energy when necessary is really high. So I want you to imagine, it's almost in a weird way like a hybrid car. It's like a hybrid car can sit at a stoplight and not really use any fuel. I mean, yes, they use fuel because they're using from a battery, which definitely uses fuel. Don't get me wrong, in a weird way, right? Point is, there's no emissions, it's just low, low demand. And then once you crank it up, then you can actually go ahead and use fuel aggressively. Then it turns into a Lamborghini, right? So your mitochondria, the ability to idle at sort of a low speed and then aggressively increase energy and increase uh, ATP production from ADP, very, very important. But one of the things that I found the most interesting is that nicotine reduced the superoxide creation. So it reduced the amount of sort of free radicals that were created from the mitochondria. Okay, so when nicotine was present, superoxide only increased 39%. When nicotine was not present, it was over 60%. So we had like a 23, 24% reduction in reactive oxygen species or superoxide that was released from the mitochondria. That means that the mitochondria is releasing less kind of, well, oxidative stress when nicotine is in the equation, at least in rodents. I don't know, but it's looking fairly promising. Now, are there downsides? And we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but so far it seems as though the downsides could be potential addictive qualities, right? It also could be that you might get a little bit of a dopaminergic letdown the next day, and you might feel like you need more of it to get the job done. So I think where it's going with this, I can't speak out of turn, but where it looks like the literature is pointing us is that occasional utilization. Now, a lot of the evidence is also suggesting that chronic utilization is going to be good, but again, it's in rodents, so I don't safely feel like saying <laughs> you should just go pop nicotine pouches all the time. But there is some merit there. Now I wanna talk about fat loss and obesity, because this is pretty darn interesting in and of itself. There was a study published in Life Sciences that once again took a look at rats, and it gave them either six milligrams of nicotine per kilogram of body weight, or 12 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. They found overall that weight gain reduced in all groups that used the nicotine, but not in a control group that didn't use the nicotine. They also saw a reduction in plasma insulin by 22%. Mechanistically, can't really tell you why that's happening. It might have to do with mitochondrial function. It might have to do more with uh, energy utilization, energy expenditure. There's a number of different theories as to why this could be going on. But we have to look at another paper that takes a look at overfeeding rats to help us understand what could be going on. 
This study was published in Endocrinology, and it took a look at rats that were on a high-fat diet, caloric surplus, 45% of calories from fat, or a diet with 10% calories from fat, and they were trying to make the mice obese. Okay, so they did this for eight weeks. Six weeks into this time period, they added in nicotine at a couple different dosages. What they found is that the nicotine ended up dramatically reducing the food intake of the rats, but it also reduced their overall weight, reduced their body fat percentage, and maintained their lean body mass. Extremely exciting stuff to show that, okay, there's a preservation effect, but there's a, a specific fat loss effect. And when you dig deep into the literature on this, you see the couple potential mechanisms. There's a reduction of what's called fatty acid synthase, which just like the name implies, synthesizes fatty acids. It synthesizes fat, right? So if you have a reduction in fatty acid synthase, metabolically, you might store less visceral fat, you might store less body fat, and definitely less uh, liver fat in that particular case, because that's where fatty acid synthase really works a lot. Very promising there. There was also a decrease in AMPK at the hypothalamic level and an increase in phosphorylation systemically. AMPK is like our marker of a deficit, right? So like if the brain is registering that we're in a deficit, it's not as good, but if the body's registering that we're in a deficit, it's great, right? So overall AMPK phosphorylation went up, meaning the body was in quote unquote, more of a deficit in upregulating processes that would normally upregulate if you were eating less. Things like autophagy, things like fatty acid oxidation, yada yada, all these metabolic benefits. Now again, this is rodents, so does it work well in humans? I don't know. I would love to see a study that takes a look at chronic nicotine users, whether it's smoking, pouches, or what, and address their BMI, like address their body weight, address their body fat, because I do know a lot of people, and this is not to give a license to this, that use nicotine a lot, and they're pretty unhealthy, but they're relatively lean. It's kind of interesting. Maybe there is something there that we should be addressing. The last thing I want to address is a study that was published uh, talking about the cardiomyocytes, the effect of nicotine to induce autophagy potentially and prevent premature cell death in some of the heart cells. Check this out. This was published in the American College of Cardiology. Once again, rodent models. What they did is they gave them six milligrams of nicotine per day or per kilogram per day for 10 weeks. But what they did is they gave them lipopolysaccharide, LPS. So they basically added inflammation to their lives. They made these mice more inflamed. When they did this, when they made the mice more inflamed, it induced cardiomyocyte apoptosis. So like a cell death of certain heart cells. However, the cell death only occurred if nicotine wasn't present. So it only occurred in the control group. The nicotine seemed to stop the premature cellular death, the apoptosis of the cardiomyocytes, demonstrating that there could be an autophagy effect, there could be an effect on cell preservation. Really interesting stuff. Additionally, if this is a world that you're into, it didn't have any real effect on what are called toll-like receptors or angiotensin mRNA if you're a cardiology person. So we don't know the actual mechanism. Was it inflammation related? It seemed like it would have been since it basically blocked the effect of LPS, but LPS is usually very direct inflammation related, specifically on TLR, toll-like receptors. So since it wasn't TLR4 related, Research needs to be done. More research needs to be done to understand why nicotine was having this preventative effect. That's why I saved this one for last. I don't know if we can solidly say, hey, nicotine is cardioprotective, but it looks promising in the rodent model and some additional in vitro stuff that I'm not even gonna mention in this video because it's too far out in the weeds. So what is my takeaway on this? Is it worth it? I can't tell you yes or no if it's going to be worth it because there's known risk factors with it or known risks with it, I should say. But all I can say is that what smoking brings to the table and what nicotine brings to the table are two separate discussions altogether. As always, keep it locked here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.